21st Century Arts Conference. I trust you had a great day yesterday and that you found plenty to inspire you and challenge you and think about the work that you're doing. I just wanted to say that we're um, really proud to be talking about building audience capital at this conference as part of our theme. The, um, the concept and the language um, of, and the ideas around building audience capital are absolutely new. It's the first time anyone has used this kind of language or this framework uh, anywhere in the world. But obviously everybody in this room is doing things to build audience capital with their audiences every single day. Um, but there are very few people who um, have spent as long building audience capital as our keynote speaker, our next guest, Fiona Allen. Fiona's had an uh, extraordinary career working both in, as a chief executive and in programming at organisations like the Sydney Opera House, um, the Sydney Film Festival. She worked for six years as the artistic director at the Millennium Wales Centre and she's currently the chief executive at the Curve Theatre in Leicester. Um, and she's done really extraordinary things here, there, so I should say. Um, and, you know, it'd be great if she did extraordinary things here as well. Yeah. She's actually originally from Australia, and she has a Kiwi connection. Her dad comes from New Zealand, so we're really proud to welcome her home. And I'll hand over to Fiona. Good morning, everyone. Or Borodal Shavai, as we used to say in Wales. Absolutely delighted to be here, and you've just you've outed me. My father's a, my father's from Waipawa, and I actually yeah. <laughs> and uh, he he in fact only naturalised as an Australian last year. We finally got him round to it. There you are. Uh, this morning I'm going to talk to you about uh, experience I've had in audience development since moving from Australia to the UK eight years ago. We didn't know that what we were doing at the time was building audience capital because the, the term hadn't yet been coined. Uh, but first I thought I'd explain a little bit about where I'm coming from. Um, and before going on to a case study, looking at the Wales Millennium Centre, which was a brand new building opened just in 2004 where we had to build audiences absolutely from scratch. Uh, and as you just heard, I was the artistic director there. I think I'll, I'll touch upon some of the challenges that I've now encountered as chief executive at Curve, which is a producing theatre in the East Midlands uh, in England, where I've been just for the last 15 months. And what we hope to gain from a pilot project that we'll be doing with Boris Hargroves McIntyre, actually looking at how we measure audience capital. The first thing is I wanted to point out is that I'm, I'm not a marketeer or a researcher or a consultant. I'm really just a practitioner and a lot of the way I've been doing things has been either what appeared to me as being common sense or by some sort of intuition. Um, I probably have, don't go to enough conferences and don't read enough. Um, so you're not going to see a lot of charts or graphs, just sort of hear some stories about successes, you know, the things that have turned out to be successes in the way that we've, we've got there. Um, but that kind of leads me to my next point, which is that I think that the responsibility for building audiences and building relationships with audiences is everybody's business, whether you're an artistic director of an organisation or a chief executive of an organisation, everybody has to take responsibility and to champion and lead those sorts of discussions. We've really got to move beyond that idea that it's something that those people do over there in the marketing department in their mysterious ways, because I think it was Andrew who said yesterday, in his words, the idea of arts marketing is dead. I'm not sure I'd go quite that far, but I think the notion of audience engagement has to be shared by everybody. And we're only going to get there, I believe, if we align the activities that we're doing um, with our programming, our artistic teams, our marketing and communications teams, and whatever in your organisation you call learning or education or participation or basically the insight and engagement activities. And when you get those three business areas working completely together and shooting for the one goals, you start to see extraordinary results. Of course, customer insight is absolutely invaluable. Um, but as I learned, it's one thing to have an inside officer who's sitting there and crunching numbers and churning out audience data, and it's quite another thing to start using that effectively. 
uh, and you really need to, everybody across the organisation to be taking on what you know about your audiences and to be feeding that into the way you're making decisions about product selection and how you're communicating that. And finally, audience capital is not something that's just going to come to you, it's something that you have to earn and it can be really hard work to earn it but once you've done it, uh, you're on the way to having you know, to artistic success and business sustainability and all those other good words. So, on to Wales Millennium Centre, which is really the case study for today. Um, I moved to Cardiff, which is the capital of Wales, in mid-2004, which was uh, four months before the opening of this building, the Wales Millennium Centre. Uh, a bit about the centre, it was a £110 million new build, uh, it was one of the last Millennium funded projects in the UK. And in the UK, it's, it's the largest centre really outside the likes of the South Bank and the Barbican in London. Uh, this notion of having the performing arts centres or campuses is, isn't, is quite new for the UK, whereas uh, you know, in the States and in the New World, the Antipodes, we, we seem to have more of them. Um, the main building, which you see there, houses a 1,900-seat Lyric Theatre and a 250-seat studio, which I was responsible for programming. It also has vast public spaces. Um, it had a free stage that we built in its foyer space where we would present around about 500 free performances a year. So obviously that's one a day or more. Uh, just to attract people to interact with the building. We also had gallery spaces, a fine dining restaurant, two cafes, a few bars and a gift shop. So there were lots, lots of reasons for people to visit. Uh, the building was open to the public from 10 o'clock every morning, 363 days of the year. Uh, so from the outset we were trying to create something that was more than just a theatre. We were trying to also create an attraction, but with the aim that everyone who came there had some sort of artistic engagement whilst they were visiting. Uh, the, the campus is also the home of the Welsh National Opera, who presented on the main stage every year. Uh, the BBC National Orchestra of Wales, which had as an annex to the main building, they had their own 350 seat rehearsal and recital venue. The National Dance Company of Wales, which also had its own rehearsal facilities and a 100-seat dance house. And five other cultural institutions that ranged from um, uh, literary organisations through to organize, an organisation, Touch Trust, that worked with the profoundly disabled with music therapy. Uh, all of whom had their offices and rehearsal spaces under that roof. And about the middle of my time there, our Arts Council, the Arts Council of Wales, also moved in. So we had a lot of people on site. In fact, we worked out if, every, if all organisations had all their people in, both orchestras, choruses, everything, uh, we'd have over a thousand people working on site a day. So for the UK, this was a, a brand new model, really. It was a, a, a creative campus. Uh, the, the building of Wales Millennium Centre was a very ambitious undertaking for Cardiff as a city, because it's a city of only 300,000 people. Uh, it is the national capital of the nation of Wales, and the building was charged from the outset of being the National Performing Arts Centre. Uh, but the city itself already had a 2,000-seat concert hall and a very popular uh, drama theatre of about 1,500 seats that was regularly full. So really, we were trying to find another 2,000 people a night who wanted to engage with the arts. It was in a city of 300,000 people. So it was a fairly um, <laughs> difficult set of objectives to try to reach from the outset. But the opportunity was massive because we'd never had a theatre like that in Cardiff before. Um, the stage was huge, a 17 metre proscenium, um, 35 yards from front to back. It, it had the scope to put on the biggest West End shows um, the biggest international ballet companies, contemporary dance, none of whom had ever had a platform to perform in the nation of Wales before, not just in Cardiff, anywhere in the country. So there was the opportunity to start bringing work in, but with that, of course, came the, uh, the, the challenge of building the audiences for that work. So the first year... It was a really, really mixed success. I think, you know, we had done, of course, 
market research before opening the building, but it's not as though the audience has behaved in any way like the market research said they would, <laughs> which was a little bit disappointing. Um, so we, we had really mixed success at the box office. Um, the very first ballet that we decided to put on the stage was the Kirov, you know, best ballet company in Russia. We thought that was pretty special that we'd open with the Kirov Ballet doing, you know, three, three programs in two weeks. Nobody came, though. It was absolutely mortifying. It was truly, truly embarrassing to have a huge, a huge theatre that was half full for the best ballet company in the world. It was only afterwards we worked out that... Um, you know, in Wales, where it was a brand new market for ballet, they hadn't had large-scale ballet. The words Kirov meant absolutely nothing. That didn't mean anything to them. It could have been the you know, Eastern European Ballet of Estonia in, and had the same sort of market impact. So we were learning lots of lessons on the, on the way. On, on the other hand, we put on Cameron Mackintosh's Miss Saigon on tour and, of course, every seat sold. So we're learning lots of programming lessons. Um, and we've, we found that some productions just sold very, very well from the outset. Others failed to appeal to anybody. Some were absolutely the right shows, but we'd scheduled them at the wrong time of the year, or we put them on for too long. They overstayed their welcome, so they, they would have been great for three weeks, but pretty rotten for five weeks. Our pricing was absolutely inconsistent because we fell into that trap of panic discounting. When things weren't selling, we started discounting the tickets which completely devalued what we were trying to do and sent mixed messages out to the potential audience because why would you ever buy a full price ticket if there was a chance of getting a, a two-for-one deal or a £10 ticket or a discount you know, the day before. So the yield from our tickets was terrible, really. I mean, our business model had been predicated on attracting an audience from a drive time of around about an hour away. But to start with, in the first year, really we're only attracting people from Cardiff or from South Wales who were interested in seeing what was going on because we hadn't invested the time yet in building awareness outside of Cardiff. So there was a lot to do and we had a marketing and media team of only five people. And I know that sounds like a lot for, you know, if you're working in a smaller organisation, but for something of this size and scale, five was absolutely nothing, especially when we were trying to build an, you know, an audience from scratch. We started with no database. And to compound things, as it happened in the first year, the Director of Marketing and Communications um, left the organisation and we were left in a bit of a black hole there with um, making matters a lot worse. In fact, the only department that was successful in our first year really was our public programming department because they'd been running for several years before opening and had a really busy program of engagement already with schools, with outreach. They started running guided tours through the building, putting on the free performances, and they were going gung-ho. It was fantastic. So when the Director of Marketing and Communications left, I, I put my hand up one day in a meeting and said, well, I'll take it on for a short time, just while we figure something else. Um, because in previous roles as Chief Executive at Sydney Film Festival and other things, at least I'd had an oversight view of marketing. And I'm not a specialist. I you know, thought I had a few ideas of what might make it better. I thought the first one would be telling people that we had shows on, which, um, <laughs> <laughs> amazingly, it, it was... <laughs> That, that worked. <laughs> um, so I think probably the first thing I set out to do was to try to make the department better resourced and argue for more resources. And um, I, I think it was Guy yesterday speaking, I can't remember if it was in his clinic or his keynote, and saying that you know some, sometimes you, you have to spend to, to make, you have to invest to recoup. And we certainly needed to spend a whole lot more in our marketing and media department if we had any hope of selling tickets. Um, so we made some immediate improvements to sales, but just by getting more people and doing more activity. Um, but around about that time, I reappointed, a, a restructured the team and appointed a rather brilliant Kiwi as our head of marketing, um, Penn Travella, who I think many of you would know works at the edge now. Um, and he and I started a, a program of renovation and with programming and marketing now sitting in the same team, we develop mechanisms for working together and making joint decisions around matters like pricing and scheduling. We had a full-time insight officer who'd been really busy churning out data, as I alluded to, but the difference was we weren't so much in crisis management all the time, we had a chance to listen to what she had to say and then to use what we were learning from our insight officer and to use that to inform our programming and 
improve our campaign planning and improve our return on investment from marketing campaigns. So we started selling our shows much more consistently um, and we had a much better idea of who was coming to them. Uh, the pricing review yielded, the pen undertook it, yielded immediate results and we had much stricter guidelines about what we would charge for what sort of work and never to discount. You had to just hold your nerve and not discount. Um, and as ever, our public programs team were really busy with their school's activities and churning out lots of outreach activity and uh, going great guns. But it was becoming more and more apparent to us as, as we were having discussions about which audiences we wanted to build and how we wanted to engage with them and how we programmed for those audiences that the work the public programs team were doing quite separately um, was having no bearing at all upon the audiences we were trying to develop for the theatres. It was like its own empire that had no relationship to trying to drive ticket sales or convert those people into ticket buyers. Um, and it was almost a chasm opening up in the organisation. So we really needed to bring them into the sorts of discussions we were having about developing longer term relationships with our public. And that all changed in year four when I did have the opportunity to bring public programs into the fold. Um, so we now had one big department housing public programming activity, the programming of the theatres and our marketing and media teams. And I felt at last that I had all the ingredients I needed to make some real inroads into making a much more innovative program, building audiences and also really ramping up the public profile for the huge breadth of work that we were putting on at the centre but not communicating very well. So the new portfolio was named Arts and Audience Development and that was really very intentional to put arts and the audiences right at the very heart of the organisation. And with it, by necessity, had to come a new way of working, which I'll go into in a sec. Um, but first we needed to make some cohesion from all the various disconnected bits of our artistic activity. We needed to look at our vision and who we were and work on artistic strategy and figure out what we were trying to achieve as a creative organisation. And at that point my role became that of artistic director, so I had responsibility for creating that artistic vision and pulling together everything we'd been doing in the public programming work. Um, so our off-stage activity, so our non-ticketed performances and our ticketed performances, the work we were doing with emerging artists and so forth. Um, and trying to integrate the artistic activity with our communications activity. We divided up our programmers and marketeers um, by specialism, which is um, perhaps controversial, I'm happy to take questions on that in clinics, but um, we divided everyone into either artistic or commercial sides of the business. And yes, it, this is artificial because of course everyone knows that a commercial success is only an artistic success that makes money. But it was down to supply relationships and in the UK it's a very, very different thing to work with West End producers than it is to work with people in the subsidised art sector. It's almost a completely different skill set in the types of people that you're dealing with. Uh, what had been called the education program and had been really quite curriculum based was expanded into a much more comprehensive learning and participation program because I felt very strongly that our engagement activities shouldn't be limited to schools and if we were really serious about engaging with our audience that had to be a program for people, you know, not to 100 years. And if that strand of activity was about demystifying the work that we were doing in the theatres or de demystifying um, the arts, lowering barriers to theatre attendance and building audience engagement, then we had to be running activity for all ages. So where it gets a bit interesting is how we then structured the new teams. You'll, you'll see immediately that there are a lot more than five people working in the marketing side. I think to start with, we had 12, and by the time we left, it was 19. So that's a, a very big marketing and communications section. Um, but this was unusual, at least in the UK, because I think we were one of only two or possibly three organisations in the UK where the, the communications... Um, section worked into an artistic director and had an artistic lead to marketing. 
Um, and then also working to me was an artistic programs manager who encompassed our, our sort of produced work, had associate producers, the learning and participation program and the contractors and facilitators who worked there. And they programmed all the work on our free stage, our studio space, our emerging artist programs, the outreach activity, and quite a lot on our main stage as well, the ballet companies, the dance companies, the circus. Our commercial theatre manager and his support staff really just dealt with the great big musicals, and we did a lot of those. It was our bread and butter money of the program was to be putting on probably six months of the year big blockbuster musicals, and they paid for everything else. You had to have about three months of Mary Poppins to have a few nights of Philip Glass. That was the sort of equation. <laughs> But what was different was actually the working structure. Because whereas what I showed you before was the, the, the formal uh, structure of how people had you know, performance appraisals and who their boss was, actually in day-to-day -day working we divided everything up into project teams. And um, Penn and I sort of sat, sat above that as sort of guides or mentors in this, uh, or goal setters or whatever we were. Uh, and then... Depending on the show, we would set a project team to work on it. So, say Mary Poppins would have a lead from someone in the commercial theatre team, but then pull together people from learning and participation, someone from media, some from marketing, and they would work on both the, pro the programming and the delivery of that show together so that everyone was pulling their ideas. Likewise, the Philip Glass would have been a lead from the artistic theatre team. And sitting alongside that was the branding and resources people. So um, the print, the copywriting, the website, the design, all of which we had in-house were a sort of resource team that we worked with. Um, so th this, wasn't, this was quite a radical reshift and wasn't something that was um, you know, embraced wholeheartedly by everyone to start with. Because for this to work, I needed my teams to think of programmers, educators and communicators as being part of the same process. I always thought these were sort of flip sides of the same coin. That actually our process was all about audience engagement and art form development. And that was something we were all working on. It was all common goals. So, you know, maximising audiences for a single show or getting bums on seats just for a commercial musical is definitely one of those goals, but it's incredibly short-termist. Um, and it was, you know, the cause of part of our failure in the first year was we just did marketing campaigns and we'd market that show and then the next one and then the next one and everything was continually a crisis. I was much more interested in exploring a longer-term view of audience development, how we engaged the audience, how we brought them closer to us, how we built their trust, and slowly, slowly, how we let them... Oh, no, sorry, how they let us take them on a journey of discovery. And central to our thinking as a team was how we encourage creativity <laughs> and that creativity was not the sole domain of the artistic personnel, that ideas could come from everywhere and that our approach as, as a portfolio, that everyone in that group was a creator. Um, we had monthly programming ideas sessions and they were a platform for anyone in the whole team to come and discuss work that they'd seen or something they'd come across on the internet, uh, for programmers to bring specific ideas about shows that they'd seen and to bounce around whether we thought it was a good idea, whether their, their uh, colleagues thought it was you know, something we, that could possibly work, whether it was feasible, um, and to you know, try out ideas on others. Attendance at these was optional, but actually everyone came to most of them because it was such a fun session to have. But likewise, marketing campaign planning, when we got into the, the, the nuts and bolts of how we were going to plan out selling a show, would always involve at least one programmer. Um, as the starting point was always going to be talking about the work. Um, and this sounds really obvious, but it's something I've always said to my producers and programmers, that if you cannot inspire your colleagues when you're talking about the work that you're so interested in, there is no hope that they're ever going to be able to inspire an audience to come to it. The starting point has got to be the work and there's got to be somebody championing that work and communicating that. 
But we also, we, we played around with blurring um, the traditional boundaries of what it was to be a programmer or a marketeer, um, so that everyone had a little bit of knowledge. And that brought with it a healthy respect for what, what colleagues and the team actually brought to the table. For example, um, I would send our programmers to the Arts Marketing Association conference and I, I would go there myself as an artistic director. And we'd send our marketeers up to Edinburgh to see shows because we'd send them up with a short list of things that we might be interested in that were on in the fringe and they'd go up there and have a look at them and come back and we'd be able to share the ideas around that. And if I was going to look at a, you know, a very particular piece of work, say the Netherlands Dance Theatre over in The Hague, I would take a marketeer with me and we'd sit there and look at it and then talk about it and then decide whether that was the right thing to be putting in front of our audiences next. Um, so learning to rely on each other's expertise and as colleagues was very important to this. Um, sharing and understanding of brand was also very important. I'll get onto the brand review in just a second, but I'd say any one of our programmers was so well versed at the brand that they could make decisions on what to program based on our brand values. Uh, so having that really embedded across the organisation, everyone had a good sense of what product was on brand or off brand. And the result was a really integrated team. Um, they demonstrated endless enthusiasm and passion and commitment for what they were doing. And everyone had bought into artistic choices, had been involved into discussions as to what audience we were targeting, and knew how best to, the, to uh, communicate this passion externally. So really, we started from an artistic point, we're artistically led, but relentlessly focused on our audiences. Now, this is a list of the sort of things that... Uh, it's not absolutely comprehensive, but the decisions that I would make, I would expect our project teams to be making in collaboration with each other. Um, so everything about scheduling, pricing, capacity, targets, everything had to be set as a team. To start with, as people were gaining their confidence in this way of working, um, it did take time to come to some of these decisions. It did ruffle some people's feathers, as you know, some people are naturally territorial about their own knowledge and don't really want other people to have some of their knowledge. Um, and other people really embraced change wholeheartedly and thought this was great. Uh, but I felt that if audience development was truly to be the responsibility of everybody in the team, everybody needed to share the decision making. And we needed to get completely away from that standoff situation um, that I've experienced in other organisations, particularly the one I worked with in Sydney that I won't name, but it's shiny and it's got a big pointy roof. Um, and I still see it happening every day, whereas the marketeers and the programmers end up in opposite, opposite corners of the room. So if shows don't sell, uh, you know... The, 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 the program and the artistic staff will land the blame f firmly at the feet of the marketeers and say, well, they never understood my vision and they're always too pessimistic and negative when I bring them really interesting ideas. Mm -hmm. um, and, 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 and the marketing staff stand in the other corner of the room and, say, and point back and say, well, I don't understand your vision because you never tell it to me and I don't know what it is we're trying to achieve and you only told me about it two weeks before and you told me what the targets would have to be and what the price we needed to charge was and you programmed it, you know, within a month of really similar work and at those prices no one was ever going to buy tickets. So I've, I've witnessed that and I've worked with that myself and I guess that was the starting point for what I was trying to avoid. So the way we did it had everybody's input, which meant that everyone shared success and everyone also shared in failure and had to learn the lessons from any, anything that didn't work. There couldn't be that sort of blame cultural finger pointing. Now, none of this happened immediately. Um, it probably, as a process, took about three years from the point Penn and I first started it to uh, the point at which I left. Because you know, too, that changing structure is, uh, is one thing, but actually changing the culture that goes with it is something completely different and takes a lot longer. And we had some really important pieces of work to do on the way. <laughs> Firstly, we undertook a review of our, all artistic activity. So we looked at what worked and didn't work, the balance we needed to have between blockbusters and between you know, more innovative work, 
we looked at what we thought the market in Wales could bear in terms of the, the innovative international work that we did want to programme. Um, the relationship between our own programming and that of the resident companies, so taking into account what the opera and the dance company and the orchestra were already doing, what sort of outreach activity was happening there, how we worked with emerging artists, a lot of consideration about if we were the National Arts Centre for Wales, how did we reach Wales, what did that mean for art form development for the country, um, how we built learning and participation programs for all ages. So it was a review of everything we did, but out of which came an artistic strategy in about year four that really quite clearly identified what we thought the objectives were, where the priority growth areas were, um, what, what strands of programming that we'd decided to focus on. And I pulled that together and presented it to the board and had it signed off. We presented it to our funding agencies and they signed it off. And at least then we had a blueprint for a way forward and something that everyone on the team could buy into. We undertook a brand review and a relaunch. Um, this was actually led by Joe Taylor, because Penn had left by this point. Um, she came aboard after him as our head of marketing and communications. Um, because I think this was in year four, there comes a time in any new organisation where some of the assumptions around brand, often which were put together a bit like the initial market research before the, the organisation was up and running, need to be checked and tested again. Uh, so we tackled that head on and we engaged consultants, we worked with people from top to bottom in the organisation, key stakeholders, some of our resident organisations. But I think the most difficult conversations that we had about brand was actually about our relationship between the brand of our organisation and the architecture. Because we were a landmark, significant looking building and there were a lot of people, especially on our board, who couldn't see the difference between building and organisation. And it, it made us grow up to have all of those conversations around how, how were we different from the architecture and what were we and how could the brand then be transportable and how could that brand work for us on tour or work for us in outreach programs. But they were very timely um, discussions but very difficult. But one of the most important pieces of work that came out of the brand review was looking at our tone of voice because we really thought about how we wanted to speak to our audience and that what we were really trying to achieve was to create a conversation with them. So our tone of voice became known as open dialogue um, and was about having a conversation with the audience. And I'm just reminded actually yesterday of the, the lovely the woman from the culture segment who was talking about um, direct mail letters she was receiving because we, we tried very much to start writing direct mail that was about having a conversation and about engaging people with the passion about the show. Um, if you look at the final sentence, we invite and welcome creative, positive and stimulating exchanges with people in every audience we have. So this way of writing and speaking to people became a significant and almost revelationary change in the way we were engaging with our audiences. <laughs> now, we were lucky enough to have a full-time copywriter, but she was very, very busy because she had to copyright in two languages, Welsh and English. Um, but she ran workshops for people across the organisation um, who wrote copy, whether it was people writing a menu, whether it was a fundraising proposal. We needed consistency in our approach and we needed anyone who was writing public-facing copy to be buying into this. So we had, we had rules. <laughs> We had tone of voice rules. Um, here are some of them, it's only half of them, and it's not the list of what not to do. Um, but, but this way totally changed um, the way, say, we, we wrote direct mail. Because rather than being a sales pitch, our marketers might describe how they saw a performance or what it made them feel when they went to see it. Uh, or they'd use the words of somebody else who was equally involved or passionate about that show and could describe it. Uh, we made it a rule never to repeat copy between different applications. Cutting and pasting was banned. You had to write everything from scratch. Um, and this approach really did start writing a dialogue, uh, uh, developing a dialogue. We had people writing back to our direct mail letters. I mean, <laughs> how often does that happen? They'll write back to the marketing staff by name, saying thank you for your letter. 
know, I really enjoyed reading the story of when you went to see Cirque El Waz and the way it made you feel, and now I'm going to buy a ticket to it. So, and I think the final point there is really important and was also a slight revelation, dumb up. You know, assume that the audience you're writing to is just as smart as you are. All they're lacking is information. If, if I had the rules of the what not to do, it'd include a banned list of words. Exclamation marks were banned. Anything that was superlative was banned. You couldn't be the greatest show on earth. It couldn't be the must-see theatre sensation. It couldn't be straight from the West End. Anything that read like a cliché was not allowed. It was hard work, though. <laughs> Tell you what. <laughs> um, then what we got better at was using... Um, our customer insight to inform programming. This, this had been... Oh, keep doing that. We started regular presentations from our customer insight officer at, we had you know, bi-monthly or team meetings, which ensured that everyone on the team had knowledge of our existing audiences, you know, how they were responding to various campaign tactics, our ROI, where they were coming from, their geodemographic, because we were doing ACORN pro, um, profiling. And the shared knowledge was really helpful in um, our campaign planning. But as we started doing this, it became more and more obvious that our knowledge of customers was based on what the existing customers were already doing and what they were seeing. And that the way we were segmenting them and communicating them was based on the purchase choices they had already made. And we knew we were missing out on the answers to the big questions, which was what was motivating them to attend. And I think everyone in New Zealand is probably now ahead of people in the UK on this, but we did a customer segmentation project with Morris Hargraves McIntyre. Who would have thought? <laughs> but this was actually before they'd done the cultural segments mapping exercise. So we, we ended up with uh, seven, but one didn't fit on the slide, uh, segments that we, we all got to know really well. And um, ten portraits of each of those segments that describe the, the, the types of behaviour and the types of people they were. But um, here's a tip. A method that we used for working with our segments was that from within the team, whatever role people were in, we assigned a person to be the champion for each one of those segments and to get to know that segment inside out. We all had to know our segments, but one person was a segment champion and could tell you anything about that segment and what they were currently coming to and what you know, they had come to and how they might behave. And it meant if we were in big planning discussions, it was a bit like using the De Bono six thinking hat. You know, we, we change your perspective all the time. You could call on Dylan, so what, what do the culture club, what, how are they going to respond to this piece and what kind of communication do we need in order to get them into it and have someone in the room who could, could tell you that. Um, so as we were doing all of the above, I mean, very important for the outside, and we were a very measurement, um, you know, goal-oriented organisation, we did set really specific targets for growth. Segment-based, region-based, um, monetary-based, we, kind of, we knew exactly what we were trying to achieve, and we started putting together um, an evidence base really from the, the outset, and I'd say that that is critically important to be collecting the information. But for specific shows, we had targets of how many people we wanted coming in groups, where we wanted them to come from, how much money we wanted to make, and monitored all of that. I'm just going to skip through a little bit, which is actually because I'm talking too much, and this is going to be done in the clinic, but it's a case study of the way dance audience development worked, because that was building audiences from scratch. There and go straight to a, what were the end results at the end of that six years for Wales Millennium Centre. Well, pretty good actually, because from a starting point of nothing, of having no audience at all, and already having quite a lot of um, no spare capacity in Cardiff for, for another 2,000 seat theatre, we ended up selling approximately 75 to 80% average across the year, which is really at the top end of what any theatre in the UK is doing, especially as the recession came in at the end of that. We are getting the results in the middle of the UK's recession. Our main theatre was making a sizeable profit, uh, which enabled us to subsidise some of our passion projects like um, uh, Gergiev coming in and doing the UK premiere of, of the Marianski's Ring Cycle. 
Uh, we brought the Cape Town Opera up to do Porgy and Bess. Um, we did the premiere of, of Philip Glass's um, the Quatsy trilogy of all three of the Godfrey Reggio films. So it wasn't all musical, so it was, there was quite a lot of things we were really keen on uh, in there as well. <laughs> but back to musicals, we're in really high demand, especially from commercial theatre producers. In fact, we could have programmed pretty much only musicals all year if that's what we'd wanted, because we had people like the Cameron Macintosh organisation saying, of all the theatres in the world, we want to open a uh, brand new production, the new staging of Les Mis with you. Um, they've just opened their touring production of Oliver there as well. Um, and it put us in the nice position of being able to, even from the commercial program, to curate what we wanted to have there. Our ticket attendances were up to 350,000 people a year, and we had 15,000 active participants in our learning and participation activity. A huge range of um, collaborations with our local community, with the education providers, schools, all the higher education providers in the region. That's particularly around the free program, because we use that as a platform for people to be able to come and and perform. I think we had two or three thousand performers on that free stage every year who came from the local community or came from schools and higher education providers. And really, the one that we're most proud of <coughs> was that in by the end of year five, we'd become the top visitor attraction in Wales, with 1.1 million <coughs> casual visitors every year. And obviously, a lot of those people might have come just for a cup of coffee, and that was great. But because we had such an extensive public program and used our foyer space such a lot for projected art, for gallery space, they were also having an artistic engagement when we were there. So, how did we measure up? Now, long before I'd met Andrew, actually, I'd, I'd read the Seven Pillars model. Um, it was brought back from the Arts Marketing Association conference by one of our marketing officers. And as a group exercise, <laughs> we, we looked at how we thought we were measuring up in our audience development. Of course, we thought we did really well. Um, but even objectively, I was looking at these and thinking, well, vision-led, we were working to clear artistic and audience development strategies. We wrote down what we were trying to achieve, and everyone knew it. Brand driven, the brand was pretty much owned by everyone in, the, in, in my team. Um, and you know, our tone of voice, we, we were very honest with people. Um, everything was informed by the beautiful truth. The outcomes, yes, we set targets and we monitored ourselves against them and developed an audience base. Cross discipline, cross functional teams was kind of our middle name, I think. <laughs> we, we almost invented it, but interdisciplinary was just our, our default way of working. Uh, we'd been insight-guided more and more, and we had segmentations and uh, understood our audience motivations. Dialogue with our audience was absolutely at the heart of our brand and the way we spoke to people, so we were interactively engaged and personalised. Yes, I think more will come out about this in the clinics, but we did um, personalise the way we spoke to people. We gave a lot of one-to-one um, -one attention to our customers and... Uh, I think, on the whole, that we did quite well as a 21st century organisation. Um, so I'd be really interested now to go back there and to do an audience capital measurement, because audience capital as a concept didn't exist, and we were just sort of flying by the seat of our pants and us putting things in place to just try to build us a long-term audience from nothing. Uh, but I think the measurement could be quite interesting. How are we? So sometimes, though, when things are going really well, it's exactly the right time to move on. And that's what I did about 15 months ago. <coughs> to become the chief executive of this building here, um, which is a curve for producing theatre in Leicester, which is in the East Midlands of England. And one thing that really appealed to me about Curve, um, which was open just at the end of 2008, was it's much talked about architecture. It was designed by the Uruguayan architect, but he's New York-based, Rafael Vignoli, and it was his first project in the UK, so it was much talked about in you know, architectural digests and things at the time. He's designed other things like um, Jazz at the Lincoln Centre, I think there's the Tokyo Forum, um, oh, the Kimmel Centre in Philadelphia is another one of his. But the philosophy that he put behind this building 
um, was called Inside Out Theatre. And it was been quite controversial in the UK theatre business, the way the theatre is designed. Um, traditionalists think its design is absolutely dysfunctional because it completely breaks the mould of a the theatre. But um, one thing that I've learned about moving to England um, is that the English, to generalise absolutely terribly, uh, get a little bit frightened about moving away from tradition. They think that's a very threatening thing. So actually to work for something that they think is dysfunctional is quite exciting to me. Um, so to talk a little bit more about the architecture, um, the grey ring that you can see is the foyer. So the foyer actually wraps around the theatres. It's, there's a central stage, the black thing, that sits at street level between two spaces, an auditorium of 800 seats and a studio of 350 seats. But all around the stage, on all four sides, so one, two, three, four, are moving shutters. So you can open the shutters up and down and create um, many possibilities either for conventional staging or for doing something really interesting. It's also a very technically well-equipped and ambitious theatre. It's got sort of everything that you need. It's got an incredible automated flying system, for example. There's a, a clear visual connection at all points between the street, the foyer, the auditorium and the stage. There's no traditional backstage. Um, in fact, dressing rooms are in this wing here, which means that for cast members to get from their dressing rooms to the side of the stage, they have to walk in costume through the foyer. Now, there's no distinction at all then between front and back of house. So also in this, these blocks here are workshop spaces and a paint frame for painting back cloths. And they have well, double height, about this height, walls that, of glass, so that if people are in the foyer, they can actually just look through and see what's being created. So here's a picture from the back of the main auditorium. Actually, all the walls are out. So you can see all the way through to the back of the, the studio theatre. This would be the control room for the studio theatre. There's the shared stage. You can actually see out into the foyer, and that's out into the street. And here's just members of the public who are in the foyer looking through the side of the stage to what looks like a bit of a technical rehearsal on stage where they're trying out a bit of rain. So if you're coming in for a cup of coffee, you can also go and check out what's happening on stage and where a particular production is up to. And these aren't vagrants, though they well could be. They're, um, they're two of the cast members from our recent production on Berry Child who are in rehearsals and just having a break. Uh, and in costume and just talking to a couple of members of the public over coffee. So it's all very integrated and this to me was the great appeal because the, it's like the architecture, the building itself is a metaphor for the way we want to engage with our audiences. We want to demystify what's going on. We want to you know, show them what's behind the scenes in a theatre. But to race through it, you wouldn't believe but it had, in the first couple of years, almost the exact same story as Wales Millennium Centre had. Um, I won't go into it, but just to say, the first couple of years were a disaster. They did open in the middle of a recession, and the building was created in a part of town as part of, a, uh, audio, uh, part of an urban regeneration project, which was meant to regenerate a kind of run-down section of town. But... After building curve, they completely ran out of money, so they didn't regenerate anything else. So <laughs> it is true. We're kind of on our own down there at the moment. But the last couple of years, a couple of little cafes and bars have started springing up, and I anticipate in five years' time it's going to be a really attractive area of town. But, you know, I think it was very hard you know, on opening to get people even to that side of town, because you might you know, get mugged or something. Um, they'd made a critical mistake, I would say, um, I, I didn't say that Curve as a building is operated by the Leicester Theatre Trust that used to operate another theatre um, on the other side of town, and this has been purpose-built for them. But that they stopped programming the other theatre in about 2003, and that's a long gap to 2008, and they did very little by way of audience engagement of or keeping people on. And in fact, don't tell anyone, but they lost their database in the move. So starting Curve was almost like starting in Wales. It was like starting from the beginning again. But they programmed it just as though they were doing one of their regular programs in 2008, uh, in three, which was, 
you know, really very short-sighted, I think it's easy to say in retrospect. So again, panic, panic discounting, low audience figures, low ticket yield, huge spend in marketing, um, not enough people in marketing. When I arrived 15 months ago, the only person who could tell me who the, what the brand was was our head of communications. If you said brand to any other member of staff, they kind of looked at you vaguely. Um, in the first year, they lost both the chief executive and the chairman, so then went through a period of complete leadership insta instability and um, 18 months with a very good interim who started turning things around, but still not a, a permanent resource there. And we're in total crisis management, and crisis management is when some of the worst behaviours start, which is everyone just bunkers down in their own silo and doesn't talk to each other. So when I started 15 months ago, certainly we're in that position where programming and marketing are at opposite ends of the room, throwing rocks at each other and blaming each other for things not working. So the past 15 months, um, it, it, this is still very much a work in progress, but we've restructured the comms team um, from an organisation that had no stated uh, sort of vision or ambitions at the time. We went through, we did workshops with the board, lots of post-it notes, ended up with what a, a vision, a mission, sets of objectives, a three-year plan. Um, we've had, I work, I'm lucky to work with a really brilliant artistic director, Paul Kerrison, who has been with the organisation 20 years and is very known in the UK, especially for the way he directs musicals, which is genius. Um, and if you see Paul in a rehearsal room with 50 people, he knows where every single person needs to be and exactly what they should be doing but articulating his artistic ideas to the board or to funders, I think, had been more of a challenge. So he and I spent a lot of time sitting down trying to work out what, what is it and where are we going. Um, and have now written together an artistic strategy that I think everyone has really bought into and feels a lot clearer on what we're trying to achieve. So I've restructured the artistic team as well and brought in two associate directors who will support Paul and have particular remits for working um, within the community and on our learning and engagement programs, as well as directing in the main stages. Um, that, that has involved, similarly, an alignment of the on-stage and off-stage program, because a little bit like Wales, we had a huge program of off-stage activity, um, talks and exhibitions and schools and outreach and things, but none of it had anything to do with what was going on in the theatre program, and so we were really missing a lot of tricks with how to engage audiences in the theatre program. And just generally managing change. And this is a longer term change management program. Um, we're trying to build trust in each other and build trust in a collaborative approach, which is quite new to um, this organisation. But I work with a lot of very talented and committed people who buy into what we're trying to achieve and especially buy into the enormous opportunity that that building brings with us. So we've had some wins. Um, Tim. Uh, the Baker Richards came in and gave us a pricing review and instant, instant increases to yield. We sort of doubled our yield before years two and three and within us we had 40% audience growth between years two and three. So that was pretty fantastic. Um, we've, we've gone about um, doing some geodemographic modelling using Mosaic and instigating regular analysis of marketing campaigns. We've brought in an insight officer. Um, We've developed a harder to reach audience strategy where we're looking at where we particularly want to grow um, and we're hitting our growth targets in the areas where we, we you know, find have audience priority. Uh, starting to tour our work, which is very, very exciting. Um, we've just, we had a production of King and I for Christmas the year before, which has just finished a 26 week tour across the UK. It went to Scotland, Wales, Ireland, and Northern Ireland. and. We have plans for three of our shows next year to tour, so that's great. Um, importantly, we've gone from being a venue that I think producers were a bit scared to take their work to because they weren't selling any tickets to a venue where people really want to present their work. Uh, this coming autumn, we're opening the National Theatre's tour of One Man, Two Governors as it comes out of London and goes around the UK. And really excitingly, and kind of bizarrely, um, we're also um, 
working with the Harvey Weinstein organization on his new musical, Finding Neverland, based on the film. Harvey Weinstein, if you don't know, used to run Miramax, and he's now he's a Hollywood producer who produced The Artist and The Iron Lady and other things recently. But I had a very surreal day where Harvey and his cars and his entourage and all his assistants with their blackberries came down to see my venue in Perth in Leicester and <laughs> decided they wanted to open their new show with us. Um, <laughs> We've just completed a brand review and we're rolling that out across the organisation which will lead to a little bit more consistency in our communication. Also, it's, you know, our brand is our DNA. It, it, everyone needs to understand what it is. And very proud of the fact that we've just won Visit Britain's Access for All Award, the gold award for being the most accessible place in Britain this year. Oh, that's great, isn't it? But that, that's accessible not just around physical disability and access, it's our access programs, it's our uh, access uh, our ticket pricing um, at accessible rates, it's our community engagement, it covers a lot of things. Now, so what's next? Um, what's next is we need to do motivational-based uh, customer segments. And we're going to be working with Maurice Hargraves McIntyre to do a pilot project around measuring audience capital. So audience capital, those words together, I hadn't even heard the phrase until, you know, three or four months ago. But I, 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 I kind of like what it is. And I think it, it, it's very much the sorts of questions that we've been asking ourselves. And so we've said we'll, we'll, we'll be the... <laughs> We'll be the first then, <laughs> and we'll, we'll have a go at doing some data mining and seeing how we measure up on audience capital. Um, so we're about to undertake a sample survey, which will uh, divide our audience into the Culture Segments UK, uh, and, and in, look at their loyalty, their trust, their, atti their attitudes to risk, um, ask them golden questions to divide them into Culture Segments, and measure their buy into brand, both functional and emotional, as Andrew was talking about yesterday. So it's very exciting. Um, more exciting is what we hope to gain from it. Um, at the least, I'm hoping this will provide a common language for my team to talk about our audiences. Um, should it provide us with the ability to focus what we're doing, to prioritise our development strategies, to inform our programming so that we can program by segment and we can program by audience engagement um, and, and priority areas. Uh, practical levels, of course, it should um, increase our ROI and decrease our marketing spend, which are some nice outcomes of it. But really, it's so that I can harness that artistic team and get them to develop and articulate a program that responds to what we know about our audiences and is geared around then year on year increasing that audience capital. Um, because, like I keep saying, um, I think that audience engagement and, and the process of building audience capital really is something that needs to be owned by the whole organisation and that everyone will buy into. And that really, for me, is the hope of what we will achieve out of this pilot project of